All right, so should we start? So let me recall a little bit um, the um, framework that we introduced last time. Um, let me just erase those nice scale relations or whatever it is. So we deal with the following picture. We have a space time M and we have the space of fields which are maps from M to some target space V. To simplify life, we're probably gonna think for some time that V is a vector space, but then eventually it can also be a manifold. So there is a natural evaluation map to V, which takes a point in the map and gives a value of the map at that point. And here we denote the projections by and pi. Uh, now we had the following objects which define a classical field theory. Uh, well, first of all, this is a Lagrangian density. L. So this is an N form on M and a zero form on F. And we can also write it as a polynomial which depends on the variables phi and derivatives of phi. So these are viewed as formal variables times D and X. Uh, so this is Lagrangian density. And then we also introduced one more player, uh, which is uh, uh, an element gamma. Uh, let me see, I think it's an n minus one form on M and the one form on F. I think in the problem set, it was called the variational, variational form. And in our example, uh, it was completely defined by L. So there was a formula for gamma in terms of L. Perhaps I just try to recall what it was. So gamma was a sum over i minus 1 to the power i dl d, di phi delta phi and here dx1 dxn and uh, the dxi differential is crossed out. Is it, does it look correct to you? Some, something of this, something of this style. Right. Now, um, let me recall that uh, those L and gamma satisfy the following equation. So we have delta L, well, Maybe I should try to write L in the same style. So this is Jerome on F is equal to D gamma. That's Jerram on M plus Q of phi D phi D two phi. Delta phi d and x, and so these are um, 
So these are Erlen Lagrange equations. So this Q. The left hand side of the Erlen Lagrange equations. So the right hand side is zero. Um, right. So um, maybe just one, one more formula to complement it. Uh, so the action S phi is defined as an integral over M of L. And um, as a consequence of this formula, right, up to now, that's, that's our main formula. That's, that's the, the main thing that we obtained. Uh, so as a consequence of this formula, we have a formula for the differential of, of S and it's given d gamma plus Q delta phi d and x, where this plus and minus or minus sign, that's because I never know how the uh, fiber integral commutes with the, um, so in principle, you should be able to figure out what are those plus or minus signs are, but maybe I failed to do it. Right. So that's, that's what happened last time. Uh, I think you're probably maybe not in this language, but otherwise you're pretty much familiar with the picture. You have uh, a functional, this functional is defined in some local form as an integral of uh, some function, in our case maybe polynomial to simplify things of our map and its derivatives. We usually say that only first derivatives, we don't go much further. Uh, and then uh, the variation or the differential, now we call it the differential of this functional, defines for us some PDEs, so Q equal to zero, these are typically some maybe easy or difficult PDEs for the, uh, for the map phi, which lives in this um, properly defined map space. Um, so of course, this uh, already the fact that uh, functionals define for you PDEs, that's something that we learn in variational calculus, and this is amazing and very, very interesting. Um, however, what we're going to see today, or maybe we start seeing today, that surprisingly this structure, which seems to be relatively simple-minded, uh, it has its own life. All of a sudden, uh, there are many auxiliary or supplementary structures which will arise. And we'll start by looking at the first of them. Um, and um, so this one resembles very much of the course that we had with, that we, we had together last term. So namely, there will be uh, a natural two form defined on the set of solutions of the Earl Lagrange equations. So let me recall that so in L, so these are phi's in F such that Q of phi d phi d2 phi vanishes and these are solutions of EL equations. Right, so the first topic for today is a natural two form on this space of solutions. Um, so let me start with the following observations. Let, let, let's take this equation, actually today more or less all the time we'll be doing something with this equation, right? So this equation is our main tool for now. Uh, so let's take this equation and let's apply one more delta to it. So this would give us, so this would give us delta L, delta square L, 
And of course, this is equal to zero because this partial Durham differential is squares to zero. And on the other hand, this is what? This is uh, delta d gamma plus delta q delta phi dnx. Um, perhaps I rewrite it one more time. Uh, so I exchange d and delta, it gives a minus sign, and I send it to the left-hand side. So I get d delta gamma is equal to delta q d phi dnx. Now, um, where does it leave? Uh, so gamma, gamma was an n minus one, one form, right? So now we act by d and delta. So this is in omega n two m. Now let's do the following. Inside f is sitting uh, this uh, uh, set of solutions. So uh, let me bravely consider it as a subset of F. Of course, this is a little bit brave. Why? Because F, at least formally, is a kind of vector space, right? So this is a space of maps from my manifold to a vector space. What this thing is, very much depends on what, what the Euler Lagrange equations are. But let's pretend it is still some kind of finite or infinite dimensional manifold, at least the object where I can do some kind of differential geometry. Let's, let's assume that this is the case. So, um, uh, so let's restrict, so let's restrict this equation to, uh, to, to this subset. So what's, what's going to happen? The right-hand side will vanish, right? Because what happens are restricted to the locus where Q is zero. So sol EL, that's, uh, that's the locus where Q vanishes. So the right-hand side will be zero. So the left-hand side will be d delta gamma, right? Okay, so this is an interesting observation and now we're going to explore it. So on this space m times the set of solutions of the Euler Lagrange equation, if, uh, if the forms, if this set is sufficiently nice such that one can still develop some kind of reasonable differential calculus to obtain this equation. Right. Um, now let's make some assumptions on the geometry of our space-time, just, just to see a little bit better of how it works. So let's assume that M is a cylinder. It's a product of a segment times some smaller dimensional, N minus one dimensional manifold. And to start with, Let's assume that sigma has no boundary. So this means that our M is of the following shape. Uh, let me call the point of the segment T. So I will be kind of using the physical word time, but this of course doesn't, doesn't matter so much. So let's assume that this coordinate is called time. Uh, 
Um, so in this configuration, dm is a union of two copies of sigma. Let me call them sigma a and sigma b. So this is, this is the t-axis. That's the point a. That's the point b. And so this is sigma a and this is sigma b. Um, now, what does, the, uh, what does the equation tell me? Uh, so I know that 0 is equal to the integral over m d delta gamma. And now I can use the Stokes formula. And uh, taking into account that the orientations of sigma a and sigma b will be opposite, this will be the integral of delta gamma over sigma b minus the integral of delta gamma over sigma a. Well, now I would like to interpret this equation in some way. For that, I make, for that I make further assumptions. So let's assume the following. So we have solutions of uh, uh, L. Lagrange equations. And uh, perhaps here it's convenient to introduce anywhere in the middle the slice at T. This will be called sigma t. Well, uh, so we'll define a family of maps. Let me call them mu t. To the space, I denote f sigma t. And this will be maps from sigma to the direct sum of two copies of V, right? V was a vector space. I can now take a direct sum of two copies. And here phi will be mapped to phi of Tx. So the, uh, the map phi restricted to sigma t. And the t derivative of this map. So that's, so that's an element here. Right, so I can define such a map. So I, I take my, my map phi, which is defined over the whole of M. I restrict it to sigma. I get the first component. And then I take its T derivative, and I get the second component. Right. So uh, let's assume so what is the assumption? So let's assume that mu is a bijection. Of course, this is a big assumption about the structure of L Lagrange PDEs. So we'll later think about examples, but this is one of the possibilities. So this means that for L Lagrange PDEs, I have some kind of Cauchy problem if I define phi and its uh, time derivative on, on some slice, then there is a uniquely defined solution and for all kinds of reasonable initial conditions, there is a solution of, of, our, of my PDEs in this cylinder. So this very much depends on what Sol EL is. Typically in the examples which come from physics, we hope that some, some kind of statement of this type is true. Uh, so the physicists, they are arguing in the following way. Imagine that your classical field theory describes a universe or a part of the universe, right? Then you put your universe into some kind of initial conditions and something has to happen to the universe, right? So the time will go on and the universe has to move in some way. 
This means and in a unique way, right? So that's, that's, so to say, the logic. So we hope that the PDEs which do come from reasonable physical problems, they have some, some kind of existence and uniqueness property of this type. But of course, in reality, especially if the PDEs are nonlinear, it's, it's kind of, you have to prove it. So what I say, assume this is, this is a big assumption. All right, but uh, let's assume that this is uh, let's assume that this is the case. So, uh, so then notice that uh, uh, maybe, yeah. Let me write it here. Uh, so note that integral of a sigma t delta gamma defines for us a two form on f sigma t right so uh, so this element here delta gamma is uh, an n n minus 1 two form we integrate it over sigma which is an n minus 1 manifold or n minus 1 cycle this means that what remains is a two form exactly on this space. So it depends on phi and it, it depends on eventually on its t derivative because here you have all kinds of derivatives. So it, gamma depends on the first derivatives in all directions. Right. So uh, from, uh, from this perspective, we can think about um, well, maybe let me draw a picture. We can think about what happens there. In the following way. So there is our space, so EL, and it maps bijectively to many F spaces. In fact, for, for any T here, in particular for A, B, and also for this T, I get maps from so EL, natural maps which I just defined by this formula. So there is the B, the T, the A. Now, delta gamma through this integral defines natural two forms on all these spaces. So these two forms, you can pull them back to solve EL. Now, what, what does actually this equation mean? So this equation that we write here. So this equation tells us that zero is uh, B star, let me call, um, I have a slight, okay, we'll see. I have a slight problem with my notation, but let me denote this, uh, this two form by omega t, perhaps temporarily, we'll, we'll see. Um, maybe, okay, let, 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 let me also introduce a, a superscript f. You will see why. So I, I have a slight, Slight difficulty with my notation. So I, I, I take this natural two form on this space. I pull it back. That's what I what that's what I have here. Uh, and I take the two form here. I pull it back. And actually, this equation tells me that they are the same. Right. In fact. Uh, this, is, this would also be true for any t, because I can integrate, for instance, uh, by this part of my manifold M, or by that part. So, uh, in fact, I will have this star 
omega bf is equal to mu t star omega tf equal to mu a star omega af for all t between a and b. Now one can actually phrase this result in several ways. One way to put it is as follows. I can say that there is a canonical two form omega which is actually defined on sol EL. And this two form coincides with all these pullbacks. So I have all these many pullbacks, they actually all coincide and they define for you a two form on sol EL. Um, one can also say, one can introduce a family of two forms on Sol EL. Now all these forms are now defined on Sol EL. Formally they depend on T and the equation says that actually they all coincide. So d omega t over dt is equal to zero. So um, I think maybe you have seen it, I'm not sure, have you seen it in your quantum mechanics course? Sometimes, or in, sometimes people say that omega t is a canonical invariant. Okay, let me, let me then put it, put it in one more way. Um, so we can now uh, actually uh, think that Sol EL defines a map between the F spaces. So we can start for instance from uh, F sigma T go by mu T inverse to Sol EL and then go to, by, by mu t prime to f sigma t prime. So you take uh, some initial data at time t, you define a solution of your EL equations. The solution of EL equations exists globally in the cylinder and then you evaluate it at the time t prime. So this is, so we obtain a map, let me call it U T T prime, maybe a little bit like in quantum mechanics. So we can say that's the evolution defined by EL equations. Now, of course, retelling the same story the evolution will tell us that if you pull back the two form on this space to that space you obtain exactly the form omega tf. So you see I'm just retelling this is all the same so not, nothing really happens I'm just retelling this story in many different ways so you can say there is an evolution which maps one of the forms to the other. If you identify, in principle, you can also, uh, especially if this is a cylinder, you can identify all uh, F sigma spaces with each other. In this case, this equation will be telling you that the evolution preserves the two form. So sometimes one says that the two form is uh, a canonical invariant. Canonical because this evolution comes from the action principle, comes from the variation of the of, of a functional, and then you obtain this two form. So I'll now give you an example, but may, maybe before that, let, let's just look at this picture. Isn't it a little bit surprising, right? So we first uh, introduced 
a functional, okay, it's an analog of a function, and we're looking at its critical points. Now, why do we get a two form on the space of solutions? Right? It's uh, kind of unexpected, the, the least to be said, right? This structure was not, uh, of course, if you kind of construct some complicated structure and then you extract the things that you loaded into it later on, it's not surprising. But here, visibly, we didn't load any two forms into it. But now they are there, magically. Maybe one more remark before we move on. Uh, you see, I, I told you that I have all these slices at different times t, sigma a, sigma t, sigma b, and so on. But notice that in principle, I can also introduce some other, uh, some other slices which will not be necessarily at fixed t. Of course, the, the thing what, that I want is this bijection. I need those slices to carry appropriate uh, initial conditions to define Cauchy problems. But it's clear that typically, if you vary your slice a little bit, if you put it not necessarily horizontally, but somehow transversely, usually this would still work. Again, depends on your PDE, but it sounds likely. But then this means that uh, the, the formula, the integration formula, it would work again, right? So you can then define your two form on the data corresponding to this slice and uh, integrating by the part of your manifold between this new sigma and, for instance, sigma A, you again show that uh, uh, the same machinery will work. So you see, you even have many more, many more ways to think about solutions of so EL, basically any slices which would carry reasonable Cauchy data, they would be suitable, and you always have those, the presentation of your two form. Now, this was all very, very abstract, and I want to, I want to do some really elementary example. Uh, so let me let me take the case of n equal one and b equal to r, and let me take l. to be just one half dt phi squared dt. So that's a very, very easy Lagrangian density. Um, so let me, I think probably we computed gamma last time, but just, just in case, I think uh, what will be gamma? Gamma will be, uh, how is it? Maybe plus or minus, I'm not sure, minus dl over d dt phi d phi, I, I don't quite know, plus or minus? Maybe minus, right? Whatever. Uh, and here, what would it be? It will be minus dt phi delta phi up to a sign, I guess. Well, uh, here n is equal to one. So the form omega is equal to the integral of a sigma of delta gamma. But here there is no integral, right? Because uh, sigma is zero dimensional. Sigma is just a point. So this is, in this case, equal to delta gamma because sigma is a point. Uh, and delta gamma is minus delta d t phi veg d phi or d phi veg delta d t phi. So very well. So that's omega. Now what is so EL? 
so EL. These are phi's which satisfy the Euler-Lagrange equation. So what's the Euler-Lagrange equation for, um, for such a Lagrangian? So let me recall Q is equal to something like dl over dq minus dt dl over d dt sorry d phi right and so this term just vanishes because there is no uh, there is no uh, phi dependence and this term is dt phi so this is minus dt squared phi, if I'm not mistaken. So this is the space of phi's which satisfy dt squared phi equal to zero. And well, what is this? Of course, well, fortunately, we do know how to solve such an equation. So these are phi of t. Which are linear functions. Right? So these are these are solutions of our Euler Lagrange equations. Now we we should restrict our omega to solutions of the Euler Lagrange equation. So let's let's see what it gives. So we restrict it to solve EL, and this gives us delta of A plus B T veg delta and the derivative is simply equal to b. So note that a priori this is an expression which depends on t. But actually it doesn't. Because the t is a coefficient in front of delta b veg delta b, which is zero by exterior calculus. Right? So this is equal to delta a veg delta b. So and right, and we can say that this is isomorphic. This is isomorphic to R2, right? So EL is just R2 in this case. So L is R2. And omega is a two form on so EL. So L being R2. So this is probably the easiest example we can imagine of a symplectic two form, right? So that's 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 what we rediscover here, and notice that I think it's it's actually quite quite beautiful. You see, there is in principle when you start substituting phi there, phi does depend on t, but it should be arranged in such a way that the two form does not depend on t. That's what our uh, our observation was saying before, and that's what we discover here. Uh, maybe like already here, just, just to think about the following. What if you want to do some more interesting classical mechanics? So th 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 that was a free particle in, in classical mechanics. So I, I can actually subtract, I can actually subtract the potential. Right, that would be uh, a particle. Oh, oops. Right, so there will be nothing heard, or maybe a lot of things heard. The falling of the micro, right? <laughs> okay, thank you. Sorry, but it's an improvised micro, right? It has <laughs> kind of. Um, so imagine that you, you, you want to do some more interesting, if you want to do some more interesting uh, uh, classical mechanics. So then uh, here in this solution of the Euler-Lagrange equations, um, do I have the right sign? Yeah, so, 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 so there will be there will be a, uh, a force, dv over d phi term, and, and here eventually, instead of zero, there will be minus dv over d phi. Now, in general, you won't be able to write solutions to such an equation. It's, it's, it may be a very complicated equation, depending on v. 
but we hope that the space of solutions is still isomorphic to R2. So we have our Cauchy problem. We give a position and a velocity of a particle. So we give phi and dt phi at any given moment t. And we hope that we have a unique solution. But the equation is now a horrible equation. We don't know what it is. But uh, notice that when we substitute the solution of this horrible equation here in this formula, we should still get something which is independent of t. Right? So that's, that's the statement. Let me finish with uh, um, one more example. So this was a mechanics example. Let me do a field theory example. Um, let's say what we saw before, n equal to an L one half d zero phi squared. zero dx1 um, what about gamma um, so I, I'm not sure if you could remind me of the sign I always have a problem with uh, with those signs so gamma up to sign is d phi d0 phi dx1 plus d1 phi dx0 could it be? I, I'm not sure if you have notes of the previous of the previous lecture. Um, hopefully, maybe. Yeah, I. Okay, for for the sign. Well, you fix it. Uh, right. So omega. Uh, omega will be an integral of a sigma of delta gamma. So let's assume that the one coordinate is horizontal, the zero coordinate is vertical. So in fact, that's only this term that we are interested in. Yeah, could it be the minus sign? Yeah, I don't know. Um, Yeah, let's, let's assume. Uh, so this will be the integral of a sigma delta phi veg delta t0 phi and now dx1. Um, so here already there is, uh, there is a small question. Uh, before we assumed that sigma has no boundary, right? So one possibility, sigma has no boundary. Then we can imagine that sigma is perhaps a circle, right? So it's a one-dimensional manifold with no boundary, so it must be a circle. Or there is another option. Assume that sigma is just r, then of course the, uh, the considerations that I had before, they don't quite work, right? So there, instead of this picture, we have the following picture. Our m is a strip, right? It's a product of an interval times r. And uh, that's true, I can, integrate, I can integrate d of delta gamma over this strip d of delta gamma is zero, but it tells me that the integral over here minus the integral over there is equal to some kind of possibly limit of the integrals. Maybe, maybe I, can, I can first start with uh, minus r, r, and then I, I can send r to infinity, 
as we define improper integrals in the first year. So this actually means that I should say something about the behavior of my phi. For instance, we can say phi compactly supported or phi goes to zero sufficiently fast when x goes to plus minus infinity to make sense of my formulas. We, we, we don't want now to make it precise, but clearly if you want to make it work in some way, you have to, you have to impose something uh, at infinity if you want this observation on the two form to work. So now let me finish this hour with an exercise. You see, we played this game here. We substituted into the two form solutions of our parallel Lagrange equations and we observed that actually the two form does not depend on C as it, as it should. Um, so do the same thing here. What, what are the early Lagrange equations for this Lagrangian density? That we saw last time. So what are they? So this is a wave equation, right? So this is d0 square phi minus d1 square phi is equal to zero. So what are solutions of the wave equations in 2D? So now we're back to like hardcore mathematical physics. So phi of x0 x1, so an arbitrary solution of the wave equation. <coughs> Just a test question. Any function of x0 minus x1 plus any other function for x0? Right. Right, so there are two arbitrary functions, the wave traveling to the right, and another wave traveling to the left. If you want to do it on a circle, you have to think a little bit what f and g are. If you want, for instance, compactly supported, f and g should be compactly supported. Right, so there are these two waves traveling to the left and to the right. Now I challenge you to substitute this expression back into the form. So that's exactly what I was doing here. Of course, I prefer to do myself simple examples. Uh, right, so you substitute this expression back to the form. And you see here there is a lot of dependence on this x0. So uh, this thing somehow should prove independent of x0 in some way. So potentially this expression may very well depend on x0 as here you see in principle this t was there so potentially there was a danger t will participate but it doesn't so uh, how comes how comes this omega when restricted to solutions of the wave equations how comes it uh, uh, it doesn't have any uh, any t dependence of course one should also think a little bit what what does it mean, t-dependence? But, right. Sorry, I'm hugely over time. So let's have a 15 minutes break. So we resume at 20 after. Um, so I would like to uh, add just one more touch. Uh, to the story of the two form. Um, so we were all the time looking at this um, geometry of a cylinder. Let's just for a second look at some other geometry. So let's say this is this is M, and uh, we have the boundary 
the boundary of M. So M is of arbitrary shape. Uh, again, we can write down the following equation. So we have zero, which is equal to the integral of M d delta gamma. And this is equal to the integral of dm of delta gamma. So now let's try to interpret it. As before, I would like to make some assumptions on how solutions of Earl Lagrange equations look like. So let's assume the following. So we have Sol El. It maps to FDM, which is now maps from DM to V plus V. Phi, again, it maps to phi restricted to dm. And for the second component, let me introduce arbitrarily some kind of normal direction to the boundary. Doesn't matter how I do it. Say, I fix some auxiliary Riemannian metric to, to, to define those normals, but it, it doesn't matter. Like, I, I make some choice. And I define a map to to pair phi and d and phi. So that's, that's my map mu. So now it would be unrealistic to think that mu is a bijection, but let's at least assume that mu is injective. So let's assume that mu is injective. So notice that, sorry? Hmm? Okay, well, uh, so, uh, so let's, uh, so actually uh, this expression, omega equal to integral over dm delta gamma, It still defines a two form on uh, F sigma. Now what the equation says here, so the equation says that when restricted to the image, to the image on the mu of sol El, and we assume that mu is injective, so it's, it's isomorphic to sol El, Omega vanishes. So two small remarks to conclude this part of the story. Um, well, first of all, we observe that omega either defined in this setup or defined in that setup. Let me, to be definite, write it as I did it before. Is a closed is a closed two form. In fact, it's even exact because it contains delta. So it is exact. But if you but actually you can you can change the setup such that it becomes closed. So it doesn't need to be always exact. You can play with the definitions. Recall our definitions is highly flexible. In our, in our setup, it is actually exact. Now, um, our hope is that
Our hope is that it is actually non-degenerate. So this depends uh, on the setup. For that, you, you need more assumptions. So we saw that in our finite dimensional example, uh, we had omega equal to, what was it? Delta A veg delta B, right? And this is certainly non-degenerate. In the infinite dimensional context, you already have to do a little bit of topology and analysis just to say what does it mean to be non-degenerate. So, but nevertheless, that's, that's our hope. Uh, in particular, what, what would this situation, how would this situation be interpreted if we think that omega as a two form on F sigma is actually non-degenerate? So, so together this would be symplectic, right? So that's symplectic. Uh, so here we would see that mu of sol EL inside FDM is an isotropic subspace, isotropic Submanifold because omega restricted to mu of sol EL is zero, and hope is that this is actually a Lagrangian submanifold. So why I'm why I'm telling you all that? That's because much of the intuition and much of the usage of uh, classical field theory and then eventually quantum field theory comes from these ideas. Uh, so we are thinking that actually this is a machinery to produce symplectic manifolds or symplectic spaces and to produce their Lagrangian subspaces. So like some kind of automatic machinery, then of course we should make sense of it. Hopefully we want finite dimensional examples. Maybe we, we don't always want those scary infinite dimensional examples, but maybe at some point, I don't know, someone, maybe you, actually do want those infinite dimensional examples, why not? But in principle, that's supposed to be a machinery which produces it more or less automatically, and of course you need to fill in a lot of details. As, as you saw, it was like a little bit skimming the surface. We do have our proofs, but we don't have uh, properly set definitions. So, um, um, right. Okay, so now we're going to uh, start another topic, very much related to it, a continuation of it. We'll start it today, but we'll continue next time. So this is a very important notion of symmetry. In classical field theory. Uh, the first question is already what's the definition of a symmetry? And you, you know my view on definitions, so definitions change. But here I will give you three different definitions. And they will be not completely equivalent, but sometimes equivalent. So you will, you will see. So the first definition is the most naive. I say that I have a group G which acts on a space of fields and which preserves and preserves the action functional, right? So that's a clear definition. Uh, unfortunately, it is somewhat too restrictive and not sufficiently detailed for us. Uh, let's look at a somewhat more detailed definition. Let's assume that we have 
Le algebra, which acts on F. So let me recall that this means that we have a Lie homomorphism from G to the uh, Lie algebra of vector fields on F. Um, right. And mm, so for an element, say psi here, we denote the corresponding fundamental field by psi f. And we can similarly ask that the lead derivative on the psi f of s vanishes. So this would be an infinitesimal version of the previous definition. So if G integrates to the group G, let's say connected, And the action integrates to the G action. In this case, we also know from whatever our differential geometry course or from many things we discussed in symplectic geometry course, we know that this equation is actually equivalent to the equation for the, for the group in VRNs. So under some conditions, so that's the same as what we had before. But this is all still not sufficiently detailed. As you noticed, we basically up to now never work with the action. We want to work with the Lagrangian or with this variational form gamma. So we want some kind of local condition. Um, so let me give the third, third definition. So here the first definition was the action which leaves the action invariant. Here the Lie algebra action which annihilates the functional S. Now let's say G acts on F and the lead derivative of the Lagrangian is exact. Where, uh, what is alpha? So alpha should be an n minus one alpha of xi is an n minus one uh, n minus one zero form or m, m cos f. Um, so here uh, what can one say if M has no boundary. So then this equation actually helps us obtain the symmetries in this sense. So this would give us uh, so L psi f integral M of L and here we can Commute the uh, the integral and the lead derivative, and we get the integral of an exact form, and this will be zero. Right. So if M has no boundary, then we do get 
an equation of this type. But if M does have a boundary, then this lead derivative doesn't necessarily vanish. It will give some boundary contributions. So in general, in general, this is equal to the integral of a dm of alpha xi. And actually, we'll see that this is also a good notion of a symmetry. So this, this, is, this is more general than what we had before. The action does change. When you, when you act by your group, but it changes in some predictable way which depends on the boundary. So that's also uh, a good notion of a symmetry. Um, uh, perhaps just a small remark. Um, so here I wrote it alpha of psi. But of course, since the left-hand side is linear on Xi, the right-hand side should also be linear in Xi. So we can assume that alpha of Xi is the pairing alpha Xi, where alpha will be will be a differential form with values in G star. So this resembles a little bit the story of moment maps, right? So that's how uh, it worked in symplectic geometry. Um, perhaps at the moment, that, that's the proper way to do it. But perhaps at the moment it won't be so, uh, so important for us. So uh, at least for today, let me assume that G is equal to R, and capital G is either the real line or S1. And then, of course, alpha will be just a real valued form. Right. Okay, so um, let me, for a change, formulate the next two statements. S theorems. have a symmetry in the sense of this last definition uh, of the classical field theorem. The corresponding vector fields are tangent to Sol EL in more detail this means that L xi f of q restricted to q equals zero vanishes. So before looking at the proof, let me make a remark. So suppose that it works and suppose that the Lie algebra action integrates.
integrates to G acting on F. Uh, so now uh, the action restricts, the Lie algebra action restricts to the locus where the Euler Lagrange equations are satisfied. So the action integrates. This means that the action of G restricts to sol EL. Or in other, in other words, if F, if phi is a solution, then phi G is also a solution. Right? So that's, that's why we want this statement. So we want this statement because if it integrates, then from solutions we can produce new solutions to our equations. So that's, so that's the thing that we want. Um, okay. Um, let me give a proof. So all the proofs, or all the calculations today, uh, they start exactly from the same formula. So recall, we have this formula, dl, delta l is d gamma plus q. delta phi d and x. Um, and what we do, we apply L of xi f to it. Would it be okay if I drop this uh, f index? So we apply L of xi to it. Uh, well, so we have L of xi delta L. And on the one hand, we can commute the Lie derivative on the differential. So we get delta L of xi L. And is it what I want to do? Why? Hopefully, wait. Yeah, that's what I want to do. Oh, because lead derivatives commute with drum differentials. Oh. Right. So uh, we decided that this is this psi defines a symmetry. So this is delta d alpha of psi. And this is equal, so if I commute them, this is minus d delta alpha of psi. So on the other hand, I can write it as L of Xi D gamma plus L of Xi Q delta Phi D and X. And this is equal to here they again commute G L of Xi gamma plus L of xi q delta phi d and x plus q L of xi delta phi d and x. Right? So I'm just honestly applying it to everything using the standard properties. Uh, now let me reassemble the terms in the following way. Let me say that G, right, maybe I put it this way, G of delta alpha of xi plus L of xi gamma plus L of xi Q delta phi 
dnx plus q L of psi delta phi dnx. This is all zero. Now, where does it leave? Um, someone can help me. Uh, this is where all this stuff. It's in omega. It's in omega m cross f and omega what? Um, is it is it n n one right? Yeah. It's omega n one. Okay. Now, what is our usual trick? Uh, we want to we want to sit on the Euler Lagrange. So here inside. Uh, uh, inside F, there is all EL, which means the locus where Q is zero. So we can restrict the equation to this to this uh, subspace. If we do it, what happens? So nothing particular happens here. We actually don't know what happens there. But something very good happens here, right? So if we restrict it to sol EL on the F side, so this term will disappear. So after restricting to sol EL. Now, uh, so this is an N1 form. Let me integrate it over M. So the integral over M uh, yields the following. So for the first term, I will get an integral over dm of something. This delta alpha xi plus L of xi gamma. Plus, there will be the integral over m, L of psi q, delta phi, dnx, and all this is equal to zero. So now, uh, from this, I would like to conclude that this thing vanishes. Is it, is it true? Would it be true? I think it is true. The, uh, the argument is as follows. Um, so consider, so this is, uh, this is now what? This is actually a one form. Uh, this is actually a one form. Um, how can I? Hmm. I'm actually not sure. Maybe, maybe, maybe I should think about it. I think I can, I can conclude it uh, vanishes, but I... Uh, hmm. Yeah, maybe I better... Uh, yeah, let me, let me describe the difficulty and maybe we come, come back to it or you help me. So you see, I think maybe I, what I did was a little bit, so, so now this is a one form on uh, sol EL, right? Uh, I would like to argue in the following way that I can evaluate it on an arbitrary vector field here, which maybe vanishes at the boundary uh, to conclude that uh, this integral is zero. However, I think this way it's not true because I don't know that I have tangent vectors to solve EL which, which are of this form, right? So I think I, I should probably integrate this equation before restricting to solve EL and maybe I should, I should, try, to, I should try to argue 
there before like kind of passing to, to this. But okay, that, that I should probably rearrange in some way. So okay. Yeah. But also please think about it. So how to rearrange the argument so as it uh, proves this very important property. So let's let's think about it. Um, so before uh, before finishing, let me formulate one more theorem, and uh, we're going to discuss it in great detail next time. with Lagrange and L. Uh, then the following quantity So this is an n minus 1, 0 form on m cross f. Satisfies the following very simple equation. So you can find a combination of this gamma and alpha such that the Durham differential on M is simply equal to zero. So uh, we're going to prove this theorem next time and we're going to look at, at a number of examples. Um, so maybe in our formulation we can say that this is the Noether theorem. So you had the Noether theorem in quantum mechanics, right? I'm not sure whether it resembled of this Noether theorem, but let's try to make a contact with it. What, what, what does this uh, 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 yeah, on EL, which is a very, very important remark. So it satisfies this equation on Sol EL. Um, so, so let's again go to this uh, cylinder case, right? So let's say M is A times B cross sigma, and sigma has no boundary. Um, so let's define QC equal to integral of a sigma T of J of Xi. So for the terminology, sometimes one says J of Xi are not occurrence and Q of Xi are not the charges. Um, so J was an n minus one zero form. So this, the charge is a zero form that is a function on F. So if you play the same game as before, we can integrate DJ of Psi over M. 
Of course, this will be equal to zero, right, by, by, by this equation. And this will be equal to sigma b j of xi minus sigma a j of xi. And this is equal to, you can say, qb of xi minus qa of xi. So this means that on the uh, uh, on the solution of the Euler Lagrange equations, we can compute Q at any moment of time and we get, get the same thing. So in other words, like in the physics, they would say that Q is a conserved quantity. So it does not depend uh, on the moment of time where you measure it. Again, you can introduce, in addition to A and B, an arbitrary, an arbitrary time t. And recall for the symplectic or for the, for the two form, we had several interpretations. So here these interpretations will be, again, we can say that Q so L to R is well defined. There's one possibility to say it. Or we can say that uh, dqt of psi over dt is equal to 0. So that's the conservation of Q of Xi, of course, on so EL. So there will be, again, all these different interpretations how you can think about it. And, and again, you can also define your charge by integrating over some section which is not necessarily horizontal that you can also do. Uh, so this equation ensures that however you calculate your charge, it will always be the same. So this equation also has a name of the continuity of the continuity equation. Um, in fact, we'll see that this statement is even considerably simpler than the previous one in the proof. But this, this, is, this, this has huge importance. So we'll spend probably most of the next class looking, OK, the proof will take us the first, whatever, five minutes, maybe seven. And then after that, we'll, we'll look at several examples, maybe, let's say, five, six examples of how, in concrete situations, what, how, how those currents and charges, how they look like. And you will probably recognize things from your basic physics classes. And uh, maybe some of the things you won't recognize, we'll see. But this, this, this is really maybe one of the big things why we are interested in classical field theory, because there is this theorem. All right, uh, sorry for my failed proof. We'll see how it works by the next time. And I think that's a good point to stop for today.